Hero, a short Winterhaven story. The crawling fog snuffed out the weak fall daylight. Though it was only one in the afternoon, it seemed more like twilight. The fog slid like an oil slick along the curving road ahead of Jeremy West. The dense woods on either side of the two-lane highway were shrouded in the thick gray-white blanket. They were like sentinels lining the road. Jeremy felt hemmed in, and he slowed down the jeep further. His drive back into Winterhaven would now likely take double the time. His jaw clenched. It was the perfectly bad ending to a perfectly bad day. He had met his boyfriend, his ex-boyfriend, for lunch in a picturesque little restaurant for what he had assumed was a romantic afternoon. Before arriving for the meal, Jeremy had imagined a leisurely lunch with plenty of brushing of hands and secret smiles, followed by a walk to a nearby bed and breakfast for an afternoon of lovemaking. He couldn't have been more wrong. It was not romance that Ian had planned for them that day. At least it was not romance with Jeremy. Ian had found someone else. Who he had found almost had Jeremy laughing bitterly. Ian's apartment had caught fire two weeks earlier, and the fireman who had rescued him was his new love. You have to understand that when you go through an experience like that with someone, Ian had begun, You just can't forget it. It changes you. It was a minor electrical short, Ian. Jeremy had ground out with his cream of tomato bisque, cooling between them, uneaten and congealing, just like his emotions. It was just a little bit of smoke. No real fire, even. You walked out of it. But Jeffrey checked on me after. You didn't even go to the hospital. They let you go back inside after 30 minutes. Jeremy had known that these logical arguments would have no impact on Ian. They weren't likely to swing Ian's love back to him. Yet he could not help himself. Ian's pretty face become much less pretty as he frowned at Jeremy and confirmed Jeremy's thoughts with his next statement. You don't know what you're talking about. But I do. I read the fire marshal's report to you, remember? When we filed the insurance claim, or rather, when I filed it for you because you were too busy to do it yourself. You asked me to, remember, Ian? Jeremy had reminded him. But Ian was not one to let a few inconvenient facts get in the way of a good story. He had scowled at Jeremy and crossed his arms over his chest. That's the thing with you, Jeremy. You think about insurance claims, while I think of heroism. You're so, so pedestrian and, I'm sorry, but boring. You never do anything unexpected. You have a list for every single thing you're going to do during the day, and you check off each item. I mean, a list? A checked off list! You need to do something that isn't on your list. Jeremy had flinched with every sentence. It had turned from a terrible Dear John lunch to an assessment of his character. He was cautious. He was tidy. He didn't like surprises. He lived his life to minimize unwelcome experiences. Maybe he missed out on a few exciting times by sticking to his lists and his well-worn routes. But so what? Most things termed exciting were just uncomfortable. And if people were honest with themselves, which they notoriously were not, they would admit that excitement was just danger that one had survived. Jeremy thought these things with a sigh as he flicked the fog lights of his Jeep Cherokee on. The way ahead was a little easier to see with the fog lights on, but he slowed down even more until he was nearly creeping forward at the same rate of the fog. He could almost see Ian rolling his eyes at his slow speed. Jeremy never took chances. Jeremy filled out forms and read instructions. Jeremy wouldn't tear through two-lane highways in the fog for fear of hurting an animal or a person. But instead of those being good things, Ian considered them weak instead. Jeremy beat his right palm against the steering wheel with aggravation. He would stop thinking of Ian. Ironically, he was so wrapped up in trying to keep that promise 
that at first he didn't see the car appearing out of the mist ahead of him. He slammed on the brakes. The jeep rocked back and forth and the seatbelt painfully cut into his shoulder. What the hell? Who would stop in the middle of the road? They could have caused an accident, Jeremy thought. A late model sedan with tinted windows was mostly blocking the road ahead of him. It was half on and half off the asphalt. He realized why. It had been pulled off the road as far as it could go, but there was a steep ravine that lined the right-hand side of the road. Both of the car's back wheels were flat. The rims were bent, indicating that the driver had continued to drive long after the tires had lost almost all of their air. Though the fog filled the air with that white-gray mist, he thought he could see wisps of smoke rising up from the engine. Who would continue to drive a car in that condition, Jeremy wondered, or rather, into that condition? For a moment, he imagined that the car had been in a high-speed chase from the police, or maybe a victim had been racing away from a killer. Whatever the reason, Jeremy felt strangely certain that this person had been fleeing someone or something. He shook himself. His imagination often ran away from him often taking normal situations and embroidering them into an almost unrecognizable story. His imagination was one of the reasons he had to live his life in a controlled, pedestrian, Ian's voice echoed through his mind, manner. If I had been speeding or even going the speed limit, I would have crashed in the back of the sedan. So, though Ian might have laughed at my slow pace, I would have gotten the last laugh. He then felt the ridiculousness of his thoughts. Most people avoided accidents all the time. It wasn't heroic to do so. It was just normal. Still, Jeremy was annoyed at the unknown driver of the vehicle. The hazard lights were on, but the thick gray fog had drained them of all their power, making them faint and pale, almost invisible until one was right upon them. The driver, though, had not put out any road flares, which would have helped the visibility of the abandoned car immensely. Jeremy always carried road flares with him and a bright yellow sign to alert drivers to a crash ahead. Not that he had ever needed either. Still, if he ever did need them, they would be there. He tried not to feel that, too, was some sort of a failing as a person. Being prepared was a good thing. Jeremy decided that he was just going to drive around the abandoned vehicle and get home to mope in private when he noticed that the driver's door appeared to be cracked open. Is the driver still in there? Jeremy wondered. The tint on the back window makes it impossible to see if anyone's inside. Jeremy frowned as he thought how odd it would be to just leave a vehicle opened and abandoned by the side of the road like this. With no road flares! He had assumed the driver had left and was already walking to the gas station a mile or so ahead of their current location. But would they leave the car door actually open? which would drain the battery even more than the hazard lights would. But look at the state of the car. It's a mess. Two flat tires, engine smoking, door cracked open. Something happened here. Maybe someone's hurt. I'll drive around it, and if I see anything to indicate that, I'll call the police, or what does one do in this situation? It wasn't on any list that he had ever drafted. Jeremy's shoulders slumped. He really was pedestrian. He gently pushed on the Jeep's gas pedal and slowly drove around the car, darting between looking ahead to make sure no one was coming from the other way and at the damaged car to see if anyone was inside and in need of help. Just as he was even with the sedan's driver's side door, a hand suddenly slammed against the sedan driver's side door window. Jeremy jerked in surprise. He may have even made a little cry in response. His foot did jam down on the brakes, and there was a screeching sound as the jeep abruptly skidded to a halt. At that moment, the hand, as pale as a starfish, slid down the window and was lost from sight. Someone was in the car. Someone is injured in there. Jeremy seemed to just freeze at that moment. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't even think what to do. But then he swallowed and shook himself. First, safety. He had to stop blocking the road, so he immediately pulled ahead of the sedan and parked as far off the road as he could. Next, his fingers immediately pressed on the phone icon button on the steering wheel, but there was no buzz of connection. 
He looked at the dashboard of the Jeep where the phone was connected via Bluetooth and realized that there were no bars, no signal, no hunky firemen or policemen to rely on. Jeremy snorted, and there was a rather hysterical tint to his mind voice. He took in a deep breath. What do I do? But then he imagined Ian's pouty face in his mind. His ex-boyfriend would assume that he would quickly, yet safely, drive ahead and tell the authorities what he had seen. Getting involved was too messy for Jeremy. It was almost heroic. It was that last part that had him decided. He wasn't going to drive away. He was going to do something himself. Jeremy slapped his hand on the hazard lights button and jumped out of the Jeep and onto the damp pavement. The thick fog wrapped around him in a nauseating blanket. Even though they were far from the sea, the fog tasted strangely salty. or Maybe it was coppery. He swallowed shallowly as he wanted to wash the taste from his mouth, but didn't want to bring it into his belly. He was at the driver's side door of the sedan in a moment. The driver's door, which had been cracked open when he had driven by, he was sure of it, was now firmly shut. The tinting of the windows that had seemed rather light before, light enough to show that hand, now appeared black as pitch. But Jeremy only allowed these things to register peripherally. He was intent on helping whoever was injured. He was going to be a hero, goddammit. Uh, hello? Are you hurting there? Don't be afraid. I'm here to help, Jeremy called. With his right hand, he reached down and grasped the door handle. Just as he did so, images flooded his mind. They were so powerful, so real, that he was physically rocked back by them, even as his fingertips curled tightly around the door handle. In his mind, he saw a beautiful young man with striking gray eyes, a silver gray, not a leaden gray like the fog, lying stricken across the front seats. He was pale as milk, which made his raven black hair all the more startling against his skin. There was a gash on his forehead, a thin trickle of blood like a line of rubies stretched from his hairline to halfway down his cheek. He was dazed, and once Jeremy got to him, he knew the young man would be unable at first to tell him what had happened. Jeremy imagined lifting this young man up, feeling the warm press of his body against his own as he assisted him from the car. The young man's silver eyes would fix upon Jeremy's, and in that gaze, Jeremy would be lost. The young man would smile at him, revealing such white, white teeth. Jeremy shook himself. Now was not the time to daydream. Now was the time to act. Besides, it wasn't really going to be a gorgeous young man in there that would fall for him. No way would this young man look upon him as Ian had looked upon the firefighter. It was as likely as not a soccer mom who was late picking up the kids from a game and probably thought he was a rapist or stalker. He pulled on the door handle as he called out again to the sedan's occupant. Hello, are you all right? I want to help you. The door was locked. Jeremy pulled on it ineffectually again as if something would change. He looked down at the stubborn door, almost as if he couldn't quite believe that it wasn't moving. The damn door was stopping his heroism. He cupped one hand against the tinted window and peered inside the car, but he couldn't see a thing. The tint was simply too dark. H Hello? Can anyone hear me? I, I saw you before. I know you're in there. I'm here to assist, Jeremy said firmly, but he winced internally as he heard the almost demanding tone in his voice. Could one demand to save another person if they didn't want help? Likely not. Seriously, I I'm not dangerous. I'm just here to save me. A male voice drifted out from within the sedan. The voice was muffled, but Jeremy could tell it was a cultured voice, almost a hint of a British accent to it, or at least an East Coast boarding school cast to it. Jeremy's mouth opened and shut. Was the young man finishing his sentence? or begging Jeremy to save him. I, I want to save you, but the door is locked. You just need to unlock it and I'll help. There's no cell phone service out here, so I, I can't call for anyone else to come. There was a pause, and then that cultured, melodious voice was asking him uncertainly, and yet with a touch of mockery. Jeremy would tell himself that he was wrong about that aspect. Asked, Do you wish to call for help? Do you wish to move on and leave me to others? 
Jeremy blinked, and another image of the silver-eyed, black-haired young man once more appeared in his mind. The young man would have a voice just like this voice. I, I, well, no, of course not, but I, I'm not really prepared. I, I, I mean, I, I have a first aid kit, Jeremy amended. I, I could get it if, if you're hurt. There are bandages and alcohol and lots of things. Jeremy realized that the smell of copper was stronger when he got near the car. Maybe the young man really was bleeding. Yet it smelled like an awful lot of blood, more blood than one human body could contain. But that was just his overly creative imagination talking. He tried to squash it down, but it offered him yet another image. The silver-eyed young man, pale as alabaster, sitting in a crimson pool, smiling at him with those white, white teeth. Dangerous, the young man said, snapping him out of his thoughts. Jeremy thought the young man was asking if Jeremy was dangerous. I- I- I'm really not dangerous. I'm just a normal guy. I know you're scared. You, you shut and locked the door when I came over, but I won't hurt you. Hurt, the young man repeated. I won't hurt you. I won't. I would never hurt anyone. I'm kind of, well, I'm really boring. Jeremy gave out a shrill laugh that he hated immediately. <laughs> if you asked my boy, ex-boyfriend, he would tell you I'm, I'm really, really boring and normal. But you saw. You stopped. You want to help. You want to save me, the voice said, and there was a lilt of laughter and wonder to it at the same time. Jeremy shrugged. It's what anyone would do. No, no, it really isn't. It's quite brave, really. Heroic, the young man corrected him. His voice was louder, and Jeremy imagined that he had leaned nearer the door as he spoke. I'm glad you think so, Jeremy admitted, and the compliment burned inside of him. It's nice to be thought heroic. Yes, it is. I'll come out now, the young man said as the fog deepened and thickened. If Jeremy didn't know better, he would think it was night rather than the middle of the day. The cloying, coppery scent of the fog increased. Yes, yes, please come out and I'll help you, Jeremy said rather breathlessly. Jeremy was positive the car's occupant would be the silver-eyed young man he had imagined. But right at that moment, he had seen the faint shine of headlights coming towards them from the direction he had driven from. Jeremy felt a mixture of gladness and regret. Gladness because it would be another person to help the young man. Regret because if this person stopped, the young man's effusive praise of his stopping would undoubtedly be checked. Jeremy's belief that anyone would stop, that it was a normal thing to do, would be confirmed. Pedestrian again. Not wanting the young man to risk getting hit by this car, though, Jeremy said, Hold on. Stay inside. There's a car. Jeremy thought he heard the pop and clunk of the driver's side doors locked disengaging and saw the door beginning to open. The young man was going to step out. He was going to see him in moments just as soon as the car stopped or passed. Impatience filled him as he wanted to finally see the young man he would be a hero to. Jeremy moved around at the front of his sedan to be out of the way as possible as the car passed. It was then that he realized, and cursed his stupidity from the get-go, that the windshield wasn't tinted, or at least wasn't as darkly tinted. With the interior light of the sedan on as the car door was open, he could see very clearly inside the sedan's interior. All the saliva in his mouth dried up as he did. His heart seemed to stop, then rattled on at twice the speed. He heard a strange ringing in his ears. The car was empty. There was no young man opening the driver's side door. There was no one at all inside. Instead, the interior, a cream interior, was streaked with, splattered with, drenched with crimson. Blood. Too much blood. Gallons of it. No one could lose so much blood and live. The coppery scent made terrible, awful sense now. The car roared by then, 
not even slowing down to see if they were all right. Jeremy felt the whoosh of air as it veered around them, horn blazing before it was out of sight around the bend. Silence fell once more. There was a clicking sound, and the driver's side door was pushed fully open. Then Jeremy heard the tap of a heel on the asphalt. Someone was getting out of the blood-drenched car, someone he could not see. Hero, that voice whispered over the air again. Come to save me. Jeremy spun around and raced for the Jeep. He couldn't remember how he actually got inside or how he had jammed the car into drive or how he had slammed his foot on the gas or the way the Jeep must have fishtailed as it streaked away from the blood-soaked sedan. He didn't remember any of that, even though it must have happened. The sound of his heartbeat filled his ears until it was overshadowed with the sound of his Jeep's engine roaring slowly. Oh, so slowly. His heart rate decreased as the miles increased between him and that haunted sedan, even though the fog stayed with him as if clinging to his Jeep like his own personal cape. He didn't know what he had seen or hadn't seen in the sedan. It felt like a dream by the time he turned off the highway and was driving down his street to his two-bedroom bungalow on the outskirts of Winter Haven. He had already paid off the mortgage and saved six months of salary, just like financial advisors said one should if one was being fiscally responsible. Reliable. Safe. Non-heroic. And that's okay with me, Jeremy said out loud with a semi-hysterical laugh. Jeremy pulled into his driveway and shut off the motor. It ticked. There were no other sounds except the ticking and his breathing for long, long moments. Jeremy rested his forehead against the top of the steering wheel. But then there was a soft, shifting sound from the back seat, and the stench of copper grew terribly strong. Jeremy's head jerked up, even as his hands clenched around the steering wheel. His gaze went reluctantly to the rearview mirror. In that mirror, he saw a set of startling, glowing, silver-gray eyes staring back at him. Hero the young man said. And then Jeremy felt sharp teeth on his throat and nothing more. Come along.